office. I am the Reverend Mandy Beal. I am this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined today in leading our service by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, with a lot of technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, for whom we are very grateful. Until we are able to be again together in our building, our worship services will be hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then posted later on Facebook. Birmingham Unitarian Church is a welcoming congregation. That is a designation that a UU congregation can earn, and it demonstrates a commitment to learning about and doing the work of being fully inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and their families. We are also a Green Sanctuary Congregation. That is a similar designation for work in environmental justice. And although there is no such designation for racial justice work, we are deeply committed to that cause as well. As we continue using Zoom for worship services, we have a couple of reminders about good virtual church etiquette. Please don't type comments during the service. It can be distracting for your fellow worshipers. Please remain on mute during the service, including the hymns. These two courtesies are a service to your fellow participants and will contribute to the overall worship experience. There will be a virtual coffee hour after the service again today. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups, and we hope that you will participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you will join us in this virtual coffee hour and get to know people. And we also request that our regular attendees are particularly welcoming to new folks. We have one announcement this week. Our board of trustees is hosting a town hall on Friday, April 17th using Zoom. They want to give everyone an update on what they've been doing and they also want to hear from you. They want to know what's happening while you've been cooped up in your house. How's the homeschooling going? Are your kids having fun? Doing more online? Driving you crazy? Are you on the front line of workers, such as doctors, firefighters, nurses, police officers, supermarket cashiers, or are you working from home or have you been laid off? Are you alone, feeling a bit isolated? They want to hear your story and how things have been going. We are all in this together and understanding what is going on in our individual lives helps build connections and ensure no one feels left out. The Board of Trustees will also host another town hall in late May or early June to discuss church finances in detail. Think of this gathering on Friday as more of a pastoral opportunity, a time in which you can minister to each other. The Board is looking forward to hearing from you. And in the meantime, they urge you to stay home and stay safe. Again, this town hall meeting will be this Friday, April 17th at 7 p.m. I am told that the attire is black tie, but PJs are acceptable. And finally, a quick mention of our folks who don't use the internet, please give them a call. Make sure that they're okay. Also help us reach out by adding them or yourself to the phone list, which you can do by visiting our website. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. And with that, our worship service will begin. This morning's prelude is by Venezuelan composer Antonio Lara. It's called Registro, which means prelude.
We worship this morning from our separate homes, but we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists in lighting our chalice. We light this chalice as a symbol of hope and love. Let the light within us shine forth to hold back the darkness, bringing comfort and peace to a troubled world. First hymn this morning is O Life That Maketh All Things New, number 12, if you have a hymnal at home, and the lyrics will appear on your screen. Our opening words this morning come from Ian W. Rydell. We gather today in the presence of the old, old story of death defeated by emptiness, of hope and newness triumphant over fear and separation. We come hearts heavy with pain and anxiety, spirits flattened by exhaustion and apathy, vision darkened by strife and violence. We come seeking connection and love in this place of community. May the old, old Easter story of hope and rebirth lighten our hearts and make us glad in the presence of each other's love. May our spirits be joyful as we worship together today. The time has come in our service when we ask for your financial support. There is no source of funding for BUC other than the ones that we create. In the past, we have been very proud of our income from rentals and from our rummage sale. These two sources of revenue are not available to us with our building closed. Due to this loss of income, over this past week, the hours and compensation of our staff members have been reduced. I am personally truly heartbroken that it has come to this, but these drastic steps are necessary for the long-term financial stability of our beloved community. Your church leadership is doing everything that we can to support the stability of our congregation, and now I ask you to join us in that effort. Your contributions can be sent using Venmo or through our website. Our Venmo name is at BUCMI, or you can navigate to our website where there is a Donate Now button. If you need to set up accounts through either of these giving platforms, it is easy, and I urge you to do so when the service is over. And you can always just put a check in the mail. I asked you to consider how much you've relied on BUC in the past several weeks and to do what you can to support our good work. Please give generously.
For this morning's offertory song, Steve and I are singing and performing I Am Light, originally by singer-songwriter India Ari. And every time I say I am, I mean you are and we are. We have come now to the time in our service that we have set aside for prayer, reflection, and meditation. We begin each week with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. As a reminder, you can submit joys and sorrows by using our website. And if you do so, they will be read here, recorded, and available to the public. And we hope that you will take this opportunity to share what's on your heart. This week we have two notes, two notes of sorrow. First from Keith Indroth. Keith says, my brother-in-law, Brian Wota, was taken to the emergency room on Tuesday because his oxygen levels were too low due to COVID-19. Please keep Brian 
Brian's wife, and the whole family in your thoughts and prayers. We have another sorrow from Carrie Armstrong Reed, a member of our online community. Carrie says, I lost my mother unexpectedly on February 27th after being estranged for 10 years from the woman who used to be my best friend, after her coming back into my life because she was in need. I spent several weeks sleeping on the guest bed in the hospital, driving for hours to help, moving her bedroom into my dining room in anticipation of caring for her. We talked and resolved some things. She made it home for only four days. I brushed her hair and I sang to her as she died. We had so many days to enjoy together. Taken too soon, I feel that we were both cheated. I am simultaneously heavily grieving and grateful for having the chance to see her off in peace. My heart feels like it's being crushed. And we know that there are other joys and sorrows that are held closely in our hearts today. I invite you now to move further into a spirit of prayer and centering reflection with me. Spirit of our lives, and the spirit that knows no death, the boundless energy of the universe that rises again and again, always, always. We are gathered this morning as a community that is struggling, a community that is finding itself dealing with a new reality that has been put upon us. We are gathered here in the hope of finding joy, of sharing in that triumph, of looking for something to give us hope of life that does make all things new, of life eternal, life always springing forth. This week, we're also thinking of the Passover story. We're thinking of a group of people who were brutally oppressed and who found a way out. The story of liberation, of freedom, of packing it up before you were ready, trusting that as you go forward, you will be led. We are told that the Hebrew people left as a mixed crowd, meaning that they were not a Hebrew people. We come together as a diverse crowd too. In this time of a long journey through an unknown wilderness, may we also be brought together as one body. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Our reading this morning is, um, is one of my favorites. It is an excerpt from the 1962 young adult novel, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lee Engle. In this story, we have Charles Wallace, the brilliant and precocious preschooler, 
and his teenage sister, Meg, who are looking for their father. Their father was uh, abducted and imprisoned on another planet after experimenting with time travel. They are accompanied in their journey by Meg's classmate, Calvin, and they have been around the universe discovering quantum physics and the nature of good and evil, accompanied by three celestial beings, Mrs. Who's It, Mrs. What's It, and Mrs. Witch. In this scene, they are observing the Earth from space. It's the thing, Charles Wallace cried. It's the dark thing that we saw on the mountain peak on Uriel when we were riding on Mrs. What's It's back. Did it just come? Meg asked in agony, unable to take her eyes from the sickness of the shadow which darkened the beauty of the earth. Did it just come while we've been gone? Mrs. What's It's voice seemed very tired. Tell her, she said to Mrs. What's It. Mrs. What's It sighed. No, Meg, it hasn't just come. It's been there for a great many years. That is why your planet is such a troubled one. But why, Calvin started to ask, his voice croaking hoarsely, and Mrs. What's it raised her hand to silence him. We showed you the dark thing on your Uriel first for so many reasons. First, because the mountain peaks there are so clear and thin that you could see it for what it is. And we thought it would be easier for you to understand it if you saw it, well, someplace else first, not your own earth. I hate it, Charles Wallace cried passionately. I hate the dark thing. Mrs. What's it nodded. Yes, Charles dear, we all do. That's another reason that we wanted to prepare you on your Uriel. We thought it would be too frightening for you to see it first all about your own beloved world. But what is it, Calvin demanded. We know it's evil, but what is it? You have said it, Mrs. Witch's voice rang out. It is evil. It is the powers of darkness. But what's going to happen? Meg's voice trembled. Oh, please, Mrs. Witch, tell us what's going to happen. We will continue to fight. Something in Mrs. Witch's voice made all three of the ch children stand straighter, throwing their shoulders back with determination, looking at the glimmer that was Mitch Mrs. Witch with pride and confidence. And we're not alone, you know, children, came Mrs. Watson, the comforter. All through the universe, it's being fought all through the cosmos. And my, but it's been a grand and exciting battle. I know it's hard for you to understand size how there's very little difference in the size of the tiniest microbe in the greatest galaxy. You think about that, and maybe it won't seem strange to you that some of our very best fighters have come right from your own planet, and it is a little planet, dearest, on the edge of a little galaxy. You can be proud that it's done so well. Who have our fighters been? Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear, Mrs. Watts had said. Mrs. Who's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, Charles Wallace said. Why, of course, Jesus. Of course, Mrs. Watts had said. Go on, Charles Love. There were others. All your friends are open to the Leonardo da Vinci, Calvin suggested tentatively, and Michelangelo, and Shakespeare, as well as and Bach, and Pasteur, and Madame Curie, and Einstein. Now Calvin's voice rang out with confidence, and Schweitzer, and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Beethoven, and Rembrandt, and St. Francis. And the text continues with Meg adding Euclid and Copernicus. This Easter finds us in a difficult and frankly, un-Easter-like situation. Easter is already a touchy holiday for Unitarian Universalists. We like the idea of celebrating spring and the triumph of life, but we are hesitant to embrace the idea of someone emerging from a tomb, even as a metaphor. But now 
here we are. So many of us wanting to emerge victoriously from a dark tomb of sorrow, isolation, and despair. At its core, the Christian holiday of Easter is a celebration of the victory of life over life-denying forces. And yet all around us this year looms the specter of death. We all know that we are destined to die. That is an inescapable fact and truly the right and natural order of life. But there are moments in all of our lives when we triumph over the proxies of death, those ever-present life-denying forces. Being declared cancer-free is such a triumph. Getting sober, the birth of a long-awaited baby, finding love after loss. All of us can relate to the rebirth of the heart after a period of pain and hopelessness. And so we celebrate new life throughout the span of our lives, a resurrection from the dark night of the soul, troubles come and then gone. We celebrate this shared experience in spring because our lives are inextricably bound to the natural world. All around us, the earth wakes from her slumber. Birds are singing again. Trees are blooming again. The sun is gradually returning. This is the season when we most viscerally feel the triumph of life over life-denying forces, of light over darkness, good over evil. In the spring, we can believe that it is possible. And then there's this year. This year's Easter finds us not triumphant. We are not celebrating with our loved ones, at least the ways that we're used to. We are not watching all of the kids hunt eggs together. Spring may be upon us, but it is a lonely, fearful spring. This year feels more like Good Friday than Easter, and we feel the dark thing, as Madeline Lee Engle called it, closer at hand than it has been in a long time. As I look out at the current landscape, I see the dark thing, the life denying forces of evil pushing its way more and more into our world. COVID-19 has run rampant in Michigan and our country and our world and we are inundated with stories of loss. We are angry and grieving and frustrated. And what's worse is that there is no single culprit for us to direct those feelings towards. And so we absorb those feelings and we take them out on others. And when we do that, we embody the dark thing. Those life-denying forces are no longer at the fringes of our lives when we take on that anger and frustration. They are clear and present in our bodies and in our souls. But beloved, we are not called to that. We are called to be bringers of the light, to join the litany of those who have fought the dark thing. We are a people of faith, and our faith calls us to hope in times of despair, to healing in times of pain, to love in times of hate. We are more than our feelings. We are more than our circumstances. We are today 
and always an Easter people who believe in outrageously illogical hope and triumph, the triumph of life. That phrase, an Easter people, and this holiday is not the dominion of one particular religious tradition we claim it to. We are and have always been an Easter people. Our living tradition is just that, living. We are not content with hollow theologies that tell us that everything is fine and in the hands of a supernatural power. No, we believe in naming the realities around us, feeling them deeply, and in choosing to believe that we have the power to make things better. We have chosen a theology that calls us to work for a better world. We are not content to accept someone else's creeds and doctrines in the place of our personal experience. We trust ourselves to know the life-giving, life-affirming, life-sustaining forces in and around us, and we take personal responsibility for how we answer their call. Many of us have responded by doing the work of building a more equitable world. We direct that work to social or environmental justice causes, or we direct that work into building a beloved community at BUC through service and fellowship with others. Both of those avenues for answering our call to bring light to this world are currently unavailable to us, at least in the tangible ways that we're used to. And all of this, against the backdrop of a deadly disease that we have no ability to control or predict. This Easter finds many of us feeling powerless, not victorious over the life-denying forces that we so desperately want to conquer. So how do we outrageously, illogically believe and hope and the triumph of life in this time? I think that we are required to shift our focus inward. Just as we do not expect a supernatural force to intervene in the troubles of the world, perhaps we ourselves can take a break from our desire to intervene in the world. The question for this Easter tide is not what can we do? to bring more light to the world, but how can we be more light in this world? It is not a question of doing, but of being. This year, we are called to be active participants in the Easter story. This is not a time when we can passively acknowledge the goodness of life while idly watching children hunt eggs. This is the year that we have to work for it. This is not the year without an Easter. This is the year that we learn what Easter is truly about. We can't let this day slip past us like the days that have come before and will come after. Today is a special day, a holy day, and our living tradition calls us to claim this day as a living, ever-growing, ever-changing celebration, not a thing of bygone theology or currently inaccessible family traditions. This may very well be the most important Easter of our lifetime. The year that we truly and starkly came to understand what it means to be a light bringer and to fight back the dark thing. We say yes, yes to that call. Deep down past our momentary pain and despair, we know that life will always triumph. As our world reminds us Every year, at this time, life finds a way. 
The birds sing before the sun rises because they have faith that it will rise. It will come again every single morning without fail. And so we rise again and we proclaim that life goes on. Always, always life finds a way. Life triumphs over life denying forces. A light shineth in the dark and the darkness, darkness comprehended it not. Let us be the bringers of that light that has shown from the beginning of time and will continue throughout the ages. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Our final hymn this morning is A Promise Through the Ages Rings, number 344, and the text has appeared. <laughs> We go now out into our separate lives, and as we do so, may we be the bringers of light. May we find a way of embodying light, choosing life, knowing that life will always find its way forward. We are a part of that. May it be so. Amen, and blessed be.